All right, my name's Aaron. This is my friend Bob. Bob. Uh, we've known each other for over a decade. Yeah, I was gonna say 15 years probably at least at this point. I'm a oh. uh, born again Christian. You could call me evangelical or Protestant or Jesus freak, whatever. I'm active LDS. I'm LDS apologist, which most people would say. So we've known each other quite a while and we've had a lot of back and forth. And I wanted to do a video uh, at a slower pace than we might go at normally, just going at it, you know. Uh, uh, and we wanted to do so in a way that's more for public consumption so that you could kind of be a fly on the wall and maybe benefit from the discussion. Maybe it would start conversations uh, in your own life that were fruitful. So a topic for today, uh, we could go to about the 15 minute mark. The Bible says I would put forward that we're justified uh, by faith uh, by grace through faith, not by works, and uh, my thesis, so to speak, right. is that God counts an ungodly person uh, perfectly righteous, uh, with not having any condemnation, uh, total forgiveness, total counting of right, uh, being re counted righteous, uh, only if we don't work for it, if we stop trying to earn it, stop trying to prove ourselves worthy or qualified for it. Um, and the, the primary text that I would put forward for this is Romans chapter four, verse five. Okay. Uh, it says, verse four says, when, when you work, what you get isn't, isn't a, a gift in, re in return. Uh, it's your wages, it's your due. But verse five, to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So, yeah. Uh, take the baton. So um, as an LDS person, I believe, of course, that, that man plays a role to the extent that uh, we don't just get it salvation dumped on us so to speak and you're done uh, we we have an obligation to continue in good works uh, you know when a lot of times when people quote Ephesians chapter 2 they forget the, the next couple verses which say created unto good works I mean that's that's our, our purpose and and uh, and the very next chapter in in Romans that you're quoting uh, talks about the justification that God does and that he justifies all people. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 18 talks about all people have been justified uh, just as all people were condemned because of Adam's transgression through Jesus Christ, all are justified unto life. And so, to me, the very next chapter, chapter 6, has the conversation about know ye not that ye are a slave to him who you serve, whether a slave to death or or justified unto life. And so, as a Mormon, I do believe that we have an obligation, and I think it's still biblical, and we would disagree about, you know, some, some of those interpretations, but I think it's, I think it's a biblical argument to say that we still have an obligation to be saved. And one of the things I like to, the grenades that I like to throw into the tank, so Go to speak, on. is uh, Paul teaching that he himself wasn't saved, even though he kept talking to people about salvation. You, you read, uh, in Philippians and uh, in uh, First Corinthians, where he talks about um, in two different ways, but it, essentially about running the race. That if he doesn't continue the race to the end, he himself may be left out, even though he he taught all the people about it. And so, I I think that um, to put that interpretation out there that uh, it's only by grace you're saved, and that once it's done, you're always done. I I just so, don't, don't think Paul believed that. So I. The only works that I believe God wants from us yeah. come from a heart that is freely and fully forgiven. So to be most and best empowered to live a holy life, repenting of our sin, fighting our flesh, killing the deeds of the flesh even, yeah. pursuing holiness, uh, fighting our own corruption, carnality and hypocrisy, the best way to live a holy life uh, in Christ likeness is to have the foundation laid, uh, namely the free and full forgiveness of your sins. In other words, it's the uh, it's the penalty foundation beneath the power foundation. In other words, uh, I need the power of sin removed from my life, but for that to happen, I first need to have the penalty removed. So justification, what's really neat about it is that I, I deserve condemnation. I deserve to be penalized. I deserve to be punished in hell forever for my sins. Sure. The starting point and the yeah. continuing foundation of my Christian life is that God takes someone like me, uh, ungodly, uh, not worthy, not qualified, and he forgives me 
but he only does it. Here's the here's the tricky part. Romans four. He only does it if I stop working for him. So yeah. let me ask you a question, uh, yeah. more pointedly. What do you make of Ro Romans four or five in the Joseph Smith translation, where Joseph Smith says, "God justifies not the ungodly." It doesn't seem to fit the context. Uh, well, go ahead. Well, so I I personally believe. We, I don't know how much we've ever talked about Joseph Smith translation. I think it, I think it kind of falls into this whole realm of like what the Jews do with Midrash, right? So it's a part of an explanation, an expounding of uh, of what the scriptures mean. And I, I think what he's doing there is he's inserting a, a thought that um, God doesn't justify the ungodly, meaning, you know, you have to repent. You know, I, what is it in uh, Isaiah? You know, God can look at no unclean thing. God's not going to drag a sinner to heaven that doesn't want to repent. I mean, you know, in uh, so you're, let's say you're teaching seminary or institute, sure, and it's a it's a fun exegesis class that's been introduced, and you're the teacher, and you're uh, you have a student named Joseph, and Joseph is tasked with uh, giving a good exegesis of Romans four verse five, yeah. and his exegesis is that God does not justify the ungodly. Does that fit the context of Romans three chapter four? It wouldn't fit like the Greek text that we have, but. I don't think so. To be clear, the Joseph Smith translation of right is four verse five doesn't fit the sure context. It, 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 it's, it, there's no variant that I'm aware of that has. Oh, that you're in saying there's no text. There's no there's no textual support okay. for that. I, I think what he's trying to. So I was, I was asking about that's great. That's important. Yeah. So the Greek manuscript history evidence we have yeah. uh, overwhelmingly points to the English translation as we have it. Sure. It's faithful to the reconstructed Greek text. Yeah, but my I question is more about context. Given the context of Romans chapter three. And Romans chapter four does his. Uh, I mean, it is nuancing. Well, nuance seems like an no. understatement. Well, because, it's he's, like saying, because he's changing. He's, he's changing, flipping it. Yeah, he's flipping it. And the whole it, point of Romans chapter one, two, and three is that we're not godly. Correct. We're right. we're, we're sinful in our nature. Um, but I, I think also one of the things. One of the things that I think it's overlooked in in the conversation about Romans is that. Like I said, it goes on and it really describes the fact, as you go further and further into the text, that we are supposed to still keep the commandments, that we're responsible to be good. So Ab Abraham obligation. in chapter 4, for example, he grows in his faith and he gives glory to God. Right. And he walks in obedience right. by faith. Well, in, in what is it, uh, Genesis uh, 17, where, where, where the angel says... That it's because of your obedience that you're going to receive the blessings that the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. So is anything Abraham's doing though earning? It's like just to fit the metaphor, right? Chapter four, verse four and five. Paul says, if you work, you don't get it. It's your due. It's your wages. It's not a gift. Right. Paul says it is a gift. So you can't work for it like it's it's your yeah. you know, paycheck. So. But you have to act on it, is what I think. It, so how so, how according to Paul in in the context do you act on? So, so the idea is faith and living, right? So, so if you have, if you've received the gift of, of salvation, if you so, how do you receive it according? How do you receive the gift of justification according to Paul in chapters three and four? The gift, of, according to Paul, I believe he, what he's saying is in, in three and four. In three, he's saying that you know that Jesus is the one who stepped forward and, and exercised his faith. In bringing forth the uh, justification of people, I mean, I think uh, 328, in particular 329, that they're very explicit in teaching that it was Christ's faith that brought forth um, salvation. But uh, and, and so, his, his faith, his propitiation, he right? Was, he was put forward as a propitiation, right? To be received by. Well, people, right? I mean, well, I mean, we have the to, text says to oh, be received by faith. But received by faith. Right. But, but the, so what about faith makes it, the, why, is, why is faith especially appropriate for well, receiving the skin? Well, the context of that is it doesn't it doesn't actually identify whose faith is involved in the reception, right? So, so if we, if well, we look about at this. Verse, 40, uh, verse oh, 25. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, we're jumping around a little yeah. bit. Uh, oh, who God put in So Christ chapter 3 for the audience, yeah. verse 24. Well, I'll, I'll read the two verses. Sure, go ahead. 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus right whom God put forward as a propitiation third verse sorry. whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith right 
So, so there's a there's a propitiation of wrath appeasing sacrifice. Right. Jesus is that sacrifice. Correct. He's received that gift is received by faith. So this text I don't think brings it out that you're thinking about the subsequent. Yeah. That that it was you know whose faith is he acting on. But but even receiving the gift, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll even granting that right. So if I receive a gift um, and the gift says here you're saved right. I mean because I think this is the actual context of. Of Romans chapter 5 18 like I was saying is that that you received this gift everybody did according according to Romans 5 everyone received this gift and let's say so you, just to be clear your argument is that according to Romans 5 right everyone has already received the gift of justification by faith right do you yeah. think that's a position that LDS interpreters would agree with at a larger scale say at the BYU religion department I have no idea okay I have no idea I, I so I'm just saying that is what the text says. I mean, I don't have to interpret it. It says, for all have been justified, right? I mean, and the, and so, the parallel was Adam, in Adam we all die, in Christ we've all been justified unto life. And so I don't really have to interpret so, it. So for the so, audience, yeah. so we're jumping around. Yeah. Uh, three, all are sin, none is righteous, none right. are one. Right. Uh, you know, was it 10, 11 verses of a litany from Romans chapter three right. that uh, we are, uh, uh, put it mildly, we have a sin problem. Yes. And uh, Paul says, but, but, uh, well, beautiful verses here. He says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge yeah. of sin. So our sin is put on display, it's showcased, and then there's this beautiful, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed. Right. Christ has been put forward as a propitiation right. to be received by faith. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, so he goes into rap chapter 4 and say hey don't forget about Abraham he's a right. good prototype good model of this right uh, what shall we say was Abraham the kind of guy who received this uh, gift ultimately or th this justification being counted righteous by God is this something that Abraham received by works or by faith right and then that's when we get this uh, accounting metaphor right. if you work for something that what you get in return is not a gift it's just it's your due right but if you stop working for it you trust him who justifies the ungodly verse 5 your faith is counted for righteousness. This is a lot like uh, uh, right. David celebrated in, in the Psalms, blessed is the one who's forgiven. And then he goes right. through how Abraham grew in his faith, uh, yet there's this chronological argument that Abraham was justified before the law was even given. Sure. And Paul sees significance in that, in, in that uh, he is a, uh, a prototype, an example of what it's like to be justified for us even today. We're, you know, Johnny come lately, Gentile, non Jew Christians who receive the free gift by grace through faith. And then Abraham grows in this faith and he gives glory to God. So we get to chapter five. I'm sorry, I'm trying to. No, you're fine. Give some context. Chapter five, uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we stand in this position we have with, by, by grace through faith. We grow, uh, we rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, I'm skipping no, you're fine. a little bit here, but um, Christ died for his enemies. Uh, so, so I'm skipping over a little bit. Right, but Go ahead. So, then, yeah. so then we Please. get to Adam. So the first man, Adam, is, yes. is then described. And, and the fact that, that all that stuff that you're talking about is a result of Adam's transgression earlier on. And, and that the fact that grace abounds to cover I mean, and obviously grace is greater because there was one man and he created all these sins, but this grace is infinite. It'll cover everything. It doesn't It doesn't matter. There's obviously a finite number of sins, so to speak, but this grace is infinite enough that it doesn't matter how many sins there are. Every every sin can be covered. So, so I know you're on the spot. You don't have, yeah. uh, we have a text right here, but sure. uh, a little bit ad hoc, but yeah. how, how would you flesh out Paul's argument yeah. by way of contrast between Adam Sure. And uh, Jesus, well, so what, second Adam and first. Right, Adam. right. So you got you got the first Adam, which is Adam, and, and he, he falls, and he and his fall brings um, the ability to sin to all people, and, and we know you know death came into the world, etc. Those, those things happened as a result of Adam's transgression, and then and then we have the second Adam who came to take that away, and 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 Paul writes twice. I mean, he goes through there essentially. And does two sets of parallels where he is comparing that and, and 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 points out that all people are in fact um, in sin and will die 
and that in Christ, all people will be made alive. And so you get into verses, uh, I think 16, 17, and 18, if I can grab those. Yeah, go for it. Uh, it says, and the free gift is not like the result of the one that that one man sins. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man's, I think, <laughs> one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And then 18, it says, Therefore, as one, tr as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And so, uh, and, and this uh, translation, I don't know, what is, what version? ESV. ESV. So this is actually being a little bit soft on the, on what's being said there, because what, what he's, the, the, uh, what he's saying is that because, because it would make no sense if he was talking about the potential for forgiveness of sins of all people or potential for all justification, because the parallel was the fact that all people have fallen into sin. And he makes that repetition several so times. So there, there's two people being contrasted. Right. But it also seems there's two acts, uh, one by each being right. contrasted. The, right. the one transgression, the one act of sin, the one act by Adam. Right. Uh, for another discussion, right? Sure. Paul seems to think of the sin or transgression of Adam as real sin. Uh, the one act of righteousness under, uh, not under, but committed by Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the, the contrast of the two actions. Are, right. So the many many right, right die right. through the one right yeah, because right. they they're uh they're inheriting a, a penalty of sin and he goes many all and he yeah, does yeah. many all so he does that parallel in both verses in both sets of verses Co context rules right of course here and then 19 he says for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so by the one man's obedience many the many will be made, will be made righteous so the, the rub here i think maybe I, I don't know if this is a rub between me and the traditional Mormon approach to this particular passage. I, yeah. This is kind of novel, as I understand it from you. Um, but in verse 17, it says, it speaks, I, sure. I, I'm thinking there's a contextualization here. Okay. Those who, uh, sorry, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. So okay. so just to put forward my position, the, the beauty of this contrast is whereas this one act of sin that Adam trans, uh, did uh, yeah. brought the penalty of death for all who are under him, uh, the one act of righteousness that Jesus Christ performed uh, brings justification in life for all who are under him. Right? Sure. And so in Paul's theology, you're, you're in or you're out of Christ. Uh, to be in Christ in Romans is to have received the, the gift by faith. It's to uh, have believed in Him. It's to have ta yeah. taken the, the faith of Abraham uh, for yourself in Christ. So that's been the context. So sure. uh, I don't think it's natural to read Romans 5 in context as saying that literally every individual on earth right. is justified. So, but go ahead. Yeah. So, I, so I, again, I just yeah. keep going back to the text. Which says, you know, which keeps going and says, um, sorry about this. Now the law came, sorry, for, again, as this is verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned death, grace also might reign through the righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So. I, I believe that what he, that I believe that if you, because of the style of what he's saying, if you were to say that that he's saying that all people sin, but only some people were made righteous, then you're defeating the whole point of his text, which is that the, that would mean that the, the atonement is less effective than the sins that Adam brought to the world, and so you're really how, how less effective? Well, because they're because now what's going to happen is what what he's what I believe he's trying to say is that sin was conquered by Christ. But if there's still going to be sin remaining, then sin wasn't conquered by Christ. So it, this is basically the argument for universalism. Well, I, so, I think that if anybody think, that if anybody ends up in outer darkness, Christ's right. atonement wasn't. Well, I think that that what it's actually saying, 
people. So there's a third position. It's not you know one or the other. It's it's that there is still more to do. So having the, the Book of Mormon teaches this concept that having been justified, now we have to remain justified. So that's where our contribution by comes your in. qualifications. By our qualifications. By doing what? By staying in the covenant. You know, repenting. Uh, uh, in, the, in, you know, in Second Corinthians chapter seven, it talks say about the, uh, the chapter on exaltation and gospel principles, where it lists requirements. Yeah, would that be a, a fair list? Oh describe? no, I, I think I think that that's somebody's very uh, amazingly long list of things that they're trying to describe what a person in conversion is probably going to go pursue. But is I, that a fair list for what it takes to retain the gift of justification in your view? I, well, if. The, the simplest to me, the, the retaining the gift is to retain your covenants. and Which is to keep all the commandments? Is to attempt. And, and the, Wait, the, which is to attempt to keep no, all no, the well, commandments? No, no, well, so you keep all the covenants. I'll, I'll even go that way. You know, you keep all the covenants, or all the commandments. But the way you keep all the commandments is because realizing that we're all sinners and not going to be able to actually keep every commandment, we are instructed that the catch-all is that we have to repent and and essentially uh, what Mormons call renewing their covenants. We stay, we attempt to stay in the covenant by constantly repenting and moving forward. And I believe that that, you know, it's, that's first John stuff. You know, if anyone says that they sin not, they're a liar. And if we sin, we have an advocate. And that's that's what we have. We have an advocate. And so it's, it, so we do try and, and stay, um, you know, we try to do good. We're supposed to do that. And when we don't do good, we repent. And that's why Again, I think First Corinthians or Second Corinthians seven, where he talks about that, you know, repentance unto salvation. That that he that this is clearly aimed at members of the church already in the covenant, so to speak, and he's telling them that your repentance will lead to your salvation. That, you know, I'm I'm not sorry that I made you sorrowful because your repentance will lead so you let, to let's salvation. Let's do this. Uh, more topics for another day, yeah, but sure. uh, let's. Uh, I'll summarize my Romans 3, 4, 5 sure. sort of flow, and then I'll let you finish. Okay. All right, so uh, Romans, the flow, uh, it builds up a case for our sin and the, the futility of us being justified by our own efforts, our own qualifications. So uh, Jesus Christ brings uh, a solution to this that is not works-based fundamentally. So a uh, real key juncture here is Romans chapter 3, so this, this is the challenge to the audience, I think, I would give, yeah. uh, is to read Romans 1 through 5 for yourself and to know, uh, be basically familiar with the flow of Paul's arguments. Uh, Paul's uh, less of a preacher here and more of a, a an argument builder. Sure. It's more of a systematic theology for Paul. Uh, but Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, that uh, we can't be justified by works of the law because the law, which tells us how to be righteous, actually just exposes our sin and it, it aggravates the problem so to speak so the solution to this is that jesus christ is put forward as a wrath appeasing sacrifice a, a, a propitiation where he absorbs the wrath of god and he has put forward uh, his righteousness his faithfulness his work his one act of righteousness so to speak yeah. and this is something that cannot be received uh, by qualifying for it by your own righteousness by your works, by your worthiness. This can only be received if you stop trying to think you can be worthy of it, you can be qualified for it, and you instead uh, basically join God's welfare economy where you say, uh, I, I'm bankrupt and I can contribute zero to this. So you receive the free gift of Christ's propitiation, his wrath appeasing sacrifice, by faith as a free gift. And then Romans 4 uh, development of this is that uh, Abraham serves as a great example of how this went down. Uh, instead of working to earn for it, uh, to earn it, he, he did not, he trusted God, verse 5, to justify the ungodly. Uh, so I'm ungodly. Uh, I'm not uh, deserving of God's grace or uh, favor. Uh, I am deserving of God's condemnation. Uh, so I trust God who justifies the ungodly. And the only way he'll give that to me is if I stop working for it and start trusting him to justify me. The celebration of that is that my sins are forgiven and now I can walk in the footsteps of Abraham who by faith uh, grew strong as he gave glory to God. And the, the Romans 5 celebration of this is that we're now in a secure position of being justified by faith. We have a secure position in God's grace by faith. And now we're going to experience suffering 
uh, and we should rejoice in this because God's going to develop our character uh, and, and the, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's He's died for us while, while we were his enemies. And the, and the part we ended on was Paul wants to give a beautiful contrast of the one sin, one transgression of, of Adam and about how the penalty of that was imputed to all who were under him. Uh, and it's, we didn't cover this, but a few beginning verses of this section talk about people who didn't sin like Adam, which is sort of an interesting couple of verses. Uh, there's a sense in which some people are, uh, they're imputed with the, 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 the sin of, of Adam in a way that it, it, it kind of speaks to the parallel of people who are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. So ending this, uh, Jesus Christ is put forward as a different kind of Adam. He's a second Adam. Uh, he, he's a second kind of act of righteousness. Right. And to those who receive this gift, they're justified. Uh, they're imputed just, just as the sons of Adam and descendants of Adam were counted sinners. Those who are uh, in Christ by faith, those who receive that gift. This is the crazy counterintuitive part. Are counted with the one act of righteousness. That, that Christ's righteousness is counted as my own righteousness, as a free gift after I receive that uh, by faith. So uh, I'll have to stop there and let you hopefully give an equally long uh, I, I, So I, I think most, I think you're on most of it, okay? I, I think one of the big, you know, just hermeneutical issues, right? So a big dumb word that just means context is one of the big con contextual issues here is is Paul actually comparing Jews and all of the works of the law, or is yeah, uh, is Paul actually uh, looking at all of the Jews and all the works of the law, or is he talking about just a uh, a, a subset? Because did did Jews actually believe that they could work their way into heaven, and and they didn't? That was not that was not a uh, Jewish belief. I mean, that's one of the reasons they had Rosh Hashanah, right? I mean, they were they were killing animals and so forth. And what what the context of some of those verses appears to be is that is that uh, Paul is responding to a, a document to some degree that we found in the Qumran uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls that talks about being um, made righteous through turns out to be 26 specific commandments. If we do that, requires no faith, and that's why he's con contrasting having a faith-based life with a faithless commandment-based life is he's saying you guys are are putting too much into your um, your works but he's not talking it, it turns out that that phrase is exactly the name of this book that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls the, some um, precepts of the law and so I believe I believe that, that it's sort of maybe a little bit of middle ground I do think the gift of of uh, Jesus Christ is uh, um, is a free gift. It's uh, applicable to all people. That that uh, as Mormons we believe in the resurrection and things like that. That that comes to everyone. And so as a result, I think that when you look at Romans three, four, five, and and honestly, like the first verse of six, right? Because so what shall we do? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? So so uh, you know, future topic. I would just yeah. say. Let's, let's kind of talk about the next thing. And I would encourage, just like you said, I'd encourage people to read through that whole section and especially to make that comparison in, in chapter five where he starts talking about the first Adam and the first Christ because, because to me it, it doesn't seem logical that he's talking about a, a universal nature of sin being uh, responded to by a limited nature of salvation, a limited atonement of some so, kind. One more closing thing, only because I forgot. Yeah. I'm not trying to You're squeeze fine. more and more in. Yeah. No, um, it's fine. I'm used to this. The, 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 the JST of Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Yeah. Obviously, my position is that Smith, uh, not he just didn't get it wrong. He got it exactly the opposite of what it was meant to be. Uh, he, he was being irresponsible with the text. This is. Okay. Uh, something uh, false teacher, false prophet. It's sure. just I yeah. And, and your and position I, on that? My position is just that he was taking it as a teaching text. I mean, he was he was basically saying if if, if you focus in on that verse, um, since we I think well I don't know that'll be a future topic is that, can God look on sin and accept it? And I, I think what what Joseph was trying to teach there perhaps 
and I'm not speaking for him. And I don't even like the Joe Smith translation in general, so I'm not the right guy to come defend it. But, the, but I think that he was using that as a teaching text to say basically humankind um, still has a role to play, and that is that once all of your sins are forgiven and you're made clean, you still have to do something, which is you have to remain faithful. And if you don't remain faithful, um, then, then your sins will come back to you. And so God doesn't justify the ungodly in the sense that if you continue in sin, then, then you've squandered it. Um, but I, you know, we can talk about that. Yeah, time. so uh, thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, nice. If you have other topics that you think we should dialogue about or that you'd be interested in, please tell us in the comments. Uh, and I'm sorry if we went over 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. We're, All right, we're thanks, happy. Bob. Yep, thank you. Okay. 30.